Hello and welcome to our midweek worship service here at Berlin. And in the season of Lent, there are no more glorias, no more hallelujahs, at least not for a while. Not until we shout them again as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday. But now is not the triumph of the resurrection that should be our focus. And although we always have that in mind, but without the resurrection, we have no Christian church, no Christian faith, no forgiveness, no life, and no hope. But in this season, we focus not so much on the triumph of the resurrection, but the triumph of the cross. The cross that looked more like defeat. And we will be fixing our eyes on Jesus. And to do so, we are looking at the various vision problems that we have tonight. We focus on nearsightedness. May God bless our service. as we have learned them. For the word of God is living and active, 
It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So we come together in our confessions of prayer tonight, and so we pray, Heavenly Father, from your first commandment telling us that we are to give you first place in our lives, to the tenth commandment telling us to be content with what we have, we have sinned against all of them in thought, in word, in deed. Instead of being satisfied with what we have, we have stolen what does not belong to us. We know from your holy word that you are a God of mercy and forgiveness. And we ask for, for your forgiveness in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sin by his precious blood. Yes, God has told us in his word, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And upon this, your confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we call ourselves your people, and yet all too often we let worldly gods be come before you in our lives. The gods of this world have such tempting voices and we are so weak. Help us to turn our backs on gods like that of life, comfort, and vanity. Forgive us and help us to live lives that reflect your redeeming grace. We pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel lessons for tonight is actually from the book of Matthew, various verses that talk about our relationship with Jesus, and we look specifically at the character of Judas in the Passion story, beginning with chapter 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and get forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And then going on to chapter 26. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And then we continue. And while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. And then picking up in chapter 27. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went away and hanged himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Break. 
various theories about why Judas did what he did. The Bible doesn't tell us the why. It just tells us the what and what he did. And what did he do? He betrayed Jesus. But of all the theories I've heard, explanations of why Judas did what he did, the best, I think, boils down to this, that Judas did what he did because he was nearsighted. That was his vision problem. And because of his nearsightedness, Judas concluded that Jesus was going about this Messiah gate all wrong. He wasn't doing it right. If he was going to establish a kingdom and be a Messiah, he was going to have to start acting like it. His teaching was nice and all, but it wasn't getting the job done. And hanging out with lowlifes and poor people wasn't either. They weren't going to be of any help. Three years now, Nothing's changed. Where was the kingdom? Where's this new movement? Where's the talk of getting even? Jesus in Judas' mind wasn't stepping up. And a near side of Judas was growing impatient. So he decided that he had to force Jesus' hand. He had to make Jesus do something. And so he decided to betray Jesus. No, I don't think Judas actually thought he was doing that at all. He was just nudging Jesus along, helping him along, getting him over the hump, getting his Messiah ball rolling. For once they came for Jesus, the soldiers and guards, he'd have to do something. He, well, he'd have to fight back. And the kingdom would begin. It would begin now. Except it didn't. Judas' nearsightedness prevented him from seeing the big picture of what Jesus was doing and how he was doing it. And so Jesus is arrested. Jesus is bound. Jesus is mocked. And he's abused. Jesus is put on trial. Jesus is condemned. Jesus is losing. No, 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 no. This isn't what was supposed to happen. Except it did. Judas got the ball rolling all right, but not the one he thought. And so in despair, he, he tries to get the money back. He wants to reverse the course, undo what he has done. What good is it if he has gained the whole world but forfeits its soul? Or they won't take it back. And so what does Judas do? He throws it back. He throws it at him. He throws it as far away from him as he can. But it's not far enough. Because that stain is still there. That stain is on his heart. And nearsighted Judas cannot see even far enough to see that Jesus had come to take even that stain away, that sin away, that he came for all sin. So nearsighted Jesus, Judas decides there's only, way, only one way out. And that for him was at the end of a rope. Nearsightedness. That's our vision problem that we're looking at tonight. It's so when one can see things up close clearly, but things off in the distance are blurry and out of focus. And such vision can cause you to make bad decisions, but all you can see, all you consider is the here and the now, the present, the imminent, and not what is coming, not the future. How things might be or how it will be different tomorrow, we don't see those things. Nearsightedness makes people run up large debts now and not safe for the future, never thinking about how they will pay back those debts. Nearsightedness makes people burn their bridges without thinking about how they might need them in the future. And nearsightedness causes people to make bad life decisions like suicide or assisted suicide or euthanasia or abortion. Nearsightedness thinks the now is all there is. The suffering isn't going to change. There's absolutely no way out. And nearsightedness then also thinks wrongly about God. Like when we think like Judas, that like God isn't doing things right or that he isn't doing things quickly enough. No, 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 God. This isn't how my life was supposed to turn out, God. But God's discipline feels more like punishment when we're nearsighted. When all we're thinking about is the here and the now in this moment. But 
thankfully, Jesus doesn't have that problem. He is not nearsighted like we tend to be. He disciplines us today for our good tomorrow. He trains us now for what we will need in the future. Luther once said that everything God is putting us through now, all the trials and troubles and struggles, is because he is preparing us for the bigger one we will face in the future. Death. He's teaching us now for them. For Jesus has the long term in mind. For you see, Jesus sees clearly both now and the future. And for himself, that long term good for us meant him going to the cross then. And then suffering now, mocking now, the agony, crucifixion now, but then resurrection, then followed by ascension, then glory, and then eternity. Eternity with us. For all that was for us, he did it. He had all of this that he he had it all that he needed, but we didn't. All we had was our our now, and when that's gone, it's gone. But Jesus came so that we could have now and a future, a future with him, a future forever. Nearsighted Judas couldn't see that, didn't get that. The other disciples probably didn't either, not at first at least, not until later. And when after his resurrection, Jesus laid it all out for them and corrected their vision using the scriptures, showing them the whole plan of, of and the will of God. Judas never gave Jesus that chance. And many nearsighted people today won't either. But the Bible becomes our glasses. We need to see clearly both now and in the future. And the Bible corrects our vision. That's what happened to Jesus, really. What happened to Jesus, really, was the plan all along. That he didn't, that he did it right. But as we, who always do it wrong, from Adam and Eve down to us today, that the discipline we experience now is to benefit us in the future. And it shows us God's love, that he has treated us as sons and daughters. And without the scriptures, we don't see right. We see like Judas, we try, try to take matters into our own hands without perhaps even realizing that in the process we're betraying God. We say or think things like, if it's up to me, if it's going to be, it's up to me. But no, the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible teaches us and shows us that if it's going to be, it's because of Jesus, only Jesus, because he is love, and he is loving and always working in love for us. And he knows that he, what he's, he's doing. He's going to prepare a glorious place for us, we're told, and he's preparing us for that glorious future. Maybe it's tough right now. Maybe it's not exactly what we had in mind right now. Maybe we think he should be doing it differently. And if so, repent. That's what this season of Lent is all about. And as we repent, we look to the cross. Because then we see that he's doing it right. And he's doing it all for us. So let's look to the cross. Not in despair like nearsighted Judas, but with tears of joy. That Jesus did, not, did that for us so that it wouldn't be us on the cross. So that for each one of us, resurrection and life is guaranteed. And now knowing that, seeing clearly through the scriptures, knowing the future that awaits us in Jesus, we can help those who are nearsighted. We can be their black guides to provide for them, to reassure them, to help them to see their Savior the one that dies on the cross for them, the one who rose for them, the one who forgives them, and just maybe a little cross now will mean a lot of glory later. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord, 40 days alone, a wilderness of thoughts, tempting and inviting thoughts, which could so easily have distracted you from your task, your mission, and your vision. And yet you emerged stronger, more attuned to all that had to be done. Despite a time constraint that to our eyes would have seemed hopeless, we too live in a stressful time. Demands are made of our time that leave so little for the important things of life. 
We are so easily distracted in the wilderness of our lives by every call to go this way or that way, to turn this stone or that stone over, to turn stones into bread or leap from mountains, to do all that would keep us from the truth. And so we pray that you, that we will listen to the voices of this, not listen to the voices of this world and ignore you, but more importantly, emerge triumphant as we follow you to the cross. Give us true sight. Give us 2020 vision. Forgive us, Father, when we get distracted from our task. Forgive us those times when we try to be all things to all men and fail to be anything to anyone. And we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. And now we conclude our service praying Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you will forgive me all my sins where I've done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.